Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Natural Born Hunter podcast. And tonight, we're going to start out with this. Phil, what is better than getting 10% off on your Mountain Ops purchase? Getting 11% off your Mountain Ops purchase? That's true. And what's better than that? Well, we can walk this all the way up, but let's just go ahead and jump right up to 20% off, Will. Yes, let's not annoy our listeners by going <laughs> increment by increment till he gets 20%. <laughs> if you want 20% off your next purchase from Mountain Ops, go to GetMountainOps.com, enter the coupon code NBH20 at checkout, and boom, you get 20% off. I encourage you to do so. I love my Mountain Ops. Hell yeah, they've got great proteins, pre-workouts, they got little... BCA pills that I love, multivitamins. I mean, if you want to get jacked, just take a little Yeti, and you will be well on your way. That's it, man. And you can't beat the new flavor of the Yeti. So check it out, everybody. Once again, NBH20 at checkout. Also, uh, we are able to provide to you a pretty sweet gift code from Maven Optics which is NBH gift. If you enter that at your checkout, they will send you some free Maven swag with your purchase. I mean, these are probably one of the hottest binoculars out there today. They're fully customizable, you know, when it comes to camo patterns, colors, and not only that, they're great glass. I'm going to have Phil tell you a little bit more about that because he had a really nice expensive pair of binoculars and he sold them and got himself yeah, some no, Mavens. I Absolutely, man. I mean, when you when you look at us as hunters, we want the best bang for our buck, right? And not everybody has fifteen hundred or two grand or twenty five hundred dollars to spend on a pair of optics. So why not get as close to the good the quality of what those two thousand dollar pair of binoculars are for half the price? You know, I mean, Mavens put a excellent product together. They've eliminated the middleman and brought you the hunter, you know, the best product they can put together and kept it in a reasonable price. So, and, and, you know, if you don't believe us, you know, they're out here, they're finishing first or second in, in all kinds of awards when they're, they're putting their binoculars out there for an independent review. They just took second in a recent review on their spotting scope. And that's, there was over 30 entries into that review. Uh, all the big boys were in there too, ladies and gentlemen, and Maven, yes, on their new spotting scope, took second place in there. I mean, if that doesn't tell you, you know, that they're, they're putting out top-notch quality products, you know, I don't know what it is. Listen to me. It's money. Listen to Will. You know, they're giving us, they're giving us and our listeners the opportunity to, you know, look at, if, you, if you're watching, check out this sweet hat I got on. I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a sweet hat right there I got with my binos, right? So check it out, man. They're going to kick you a free gift. I encourage you to support the companies that are really keeping the hunter in mind. That's right. So it's for Mountain Ops, NBH20 for 20% off your purchase at checkout. And for Maven, it's NBH Gift at checkout. Try them out. At Maven Let, built, yeah, mavenbuilt.com. That's right. That's right. So get on over there and try them out. And now go on and enjoy the show. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Natural Born Hunter podcast. I'm your host, Will Bradley, along with my brother in arms, the man himself, big, sexy, Phil Mendoza. How's it going tonight, Phil? Man, how are you? Good, man. I'm doing really good. I'm feeling pumped. It was one of those days where I didn't think I'd have a good workout, but I went in and it went tremendously well, like far better than I thought it would. It just crushed it. Came home, my wife smiling. The little man had a good day today. They had bought some scones at a farmer's market which I really enjoy a nice fresh scone. So, you know, cheat day comes around, or, you know, any day that ends in Y, I'm down for a scone. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing is, you know, I love hunting. You love hunting. We both love the mountains. We both love fitness. And tonight we have a guy on who also loves those things. But not only that, he's far more put together and structured than I happen to be, which I really admire. And he puts out a lot of great information, whether it's on his website, joshnordwick.com, 
or it's on his Mountain Fit the Hunter Solution Facebook page, I'm always getting an update that, you know, he's posting and he's putting out really great info. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Josh. How's it going tonight? Doing good, man. It's good to be here. How are you guys doing? Doing good, doing good. brother. Doing good. So uh, did you just come in from a workout yourself? Yeah, I did. I've been doing some like nervous system training type work, so... I did that, then I hit the, like the steam room for a while, and I did like an ice cold shower. So I'm feeling pretty good right about now. I got natural high a little bit. Yeah, see, yeah, that's exactly where I am. But mine also might have been boosted by some Mountain Ops Yeti, and by some I mean a lot. <laughs> Perfect, man. Yeah, if one scoop's I've good, two scoops is great. Lot, oh, you're off the pre-workout. Yeah, I haven't like I used to do them a lot, and now like it's been years, man. I just I used to not be able to, like work out without them for a while. Yeah. So like I just yeah, I wasn't needed them. And then I kind of slowed down on them, and now like when I do it now, they're crazy though. They're amazing, like the best workouts ever. You know, I used to uh, I had also quit the pre workouts and well toned down on them at least and quit complete energy drinks, and then I had our well we had our son. And now it's game on with everything. <laughs> Anything to keep you awake. Yeah, right? you gotta well, stay up somehow, man. That's right. Any any port in the storm, it's like you sleeping is now whatever. You know, if you sleep, you sleep. If you don't sleep, you don't sleep. So it's just one of those things where you want to be ready to rock and roll. You gotta learn to adapt, I guess. That's true. That's true. You definitely gotta be ready to adapt. Did you uh? So you're a big fan of the cold showers. Yeah. All that. I'm getting into a lot of nervous system stuff. We can get into that later if you want to. But, yeah, the cold showers are a great way to kind of introduce the stress um, and then learn how to adapt to it and learn how to handle it and when it's positive instead of negative, I guess. So let's get right into that. Let's talk about the nervous system training and all this. I'm, I'm fascinated by it. I know Ben Greenfield's a big fan of those cold showers. Uh, why, don't, why don't we go into it? Let's dig a little deeper. Let's do it. So what are the benefits of these cold showers? Because I love hot showers. So so what, giving those up, What what's it going to benefit me? All right, so the first thing is, like, you love hot showers, but, like, if you're able to stick with a cold shower for, like, two, three weeks in a row, they're going to become something that you just, like, love and have to have every morning because they're, like, They'll replace caffeine. You won't need it in the morning. You'll be so, so motivated, so amped up. Um, but the big thing I would say, like the, the biggest benefit, is the ability to control the autonomic nervous system. So the autonomic nervous system is the word autonomic pretty much means automatic. So it's it's been thought by like all medical textbooks for a long time that humans don't have any ability to control it. Um, with a lot of new research, like if you get into like kind of the Wim Hof, um, the heart rate variability training. Um, all the new stuff's kind of saying that, that there's a lot of scientific proof, I guess, that we do, in fact, have the ability to control it. So that includes metabolism, um, immune system, uh, circulatory system, your heart rate, breathing rate, all that stuff. And how does taking cold showers help control that? Um, so a couple things, I guess, is if you do it the way that I used, like a breathing technique before, um, you're intentionally kind of, so I'm just going to start back with the autonomic nervous system. So the autonomic nervous system is broken into Hold on, I'm the parasympathetic pause you. branch and the sympathetic I'm, branch. One second, I'm pausing you there real quick. I think your chair is squeaking, so if you could not move around in your chair, that would be awesome. Yeah, Yeah. give me one second. Let's see if I can kind of screw it in so it doesn't move anymore. <clears throat> can, you, can we get his video back? I don't okay, have my video, Will. No, I don't have him either. But I thought he might have a slower connection, so it might be good not to run the video. Okay. These Montana guys, yeah, it's been there's working. no internet in Montana. We ride horses to work, man. You need to get an extra mouse on that little wheel to start spinning it faster so that way it kind of boosts the signal. <laughs> yeah, that'd work. I like oh, that. Man. All right, so this you can like just pick up. All I'm pausing, you can just pick up right from the, uh, the nervous system stuff and go. All right, so the autonomic nervous system can be broken down into the parasympathetic and the sympathetic branch. The sympathetic can be thought of as like fight or flight, and the parasympathetic can be thought of as like rest and digest. 
So anytime you're, you get a stress response, um, whether it's stressed out from not sleeping or you're doing a workout or anytime when the cold water hits you is like one, one way of putting it, you're going to get this big stress response, right? So the idea behind the cold showers is to introduce this stress. At the same time, you, you're using these bre different breathing techniques, different concentration techniques to control that stress. So it kind of gives you the ability to uh, respond to the situation instead of reacting to it. You kind of gain control over your reaction. If that makes sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. And are you shampooing and like soaping up at this time, or is it? J or are you just going in there to get hit by cold water? Um, I kind of switch it up sometimes, man. It depends. Like when I, if I wake up in the morning and it's been like a cold night and like my my core temperature is pretty low, then I'll hit the hot water for a few minutes before, and then I'll kind of switch over. Um, sometimes I'll even like get in a hot tub before and then switch over a sauna or a steam room or something like that. Um, and it tends you can really handle the cold then. I don't know if it gives as much of an effect, um, but typically I'll just hop in the cold shower. I'll do a couple rounds of breathing, like the Wim Hof breathing technique. Are you guys familiar with that? A little bit. A little bit. Not yeah. as much as I'd like to be. Okay, well, I can get in that a little bit if you guys like. Yeah, definitely, man. Cool. Um, so Wim Hof's this dude that pretty much learned to control his autonomic nervous system. We talked about that before. Um, he climbed Mount Everest in a pair of shorts. No shirt, no shoes, no socks. Um, so at first people thought he was just kind of like this freak guy that could just do these freak things. So they started testing him and they put him through these tests and he was able to uh, control his immune system too. So they tested him against uh, the cell wall of E. coli. So the, the thing that kind of makes your immune system act up and start having um, a reaction to it. Everybody else got super sick when they had it and they injected it into him and he just had like a minor headache for like a couple minutes and it was gone. Wow. So after a while, they started to think, yeah, they started to think it was just like this guy is just like this free guy that can do it. Um, so he decided he's going to train a bunch of other people to do the same thing. So we ended up training like 10 dudes to do the same thing where they could kind of control the nervous system to a point where they didn't get uh, like the same, same sickness from this E. coli bacteria. And he also trained a bunch of dudes to climb, I think it was Mount McKinley, like just like him in a pair of shorts. Like one guy was like 60 something years old with like a devil heart bypass surgery recently. So it's just it's kind of rewriting the idea of like what is possible for the human being. So it's super interesting time to be around that. And so how do how do you use that then? Um. So I'll give you an example of my workout today, and I'll kind of explain that why I did what I did. So I started off. I did I did like a warm up, kind of a day four motion warm up. Worked on I have a little bit of like internal rotation. Shoulder, so I was working on that a bit, and then I so I took two exercises like the trap bar deadlift. And I took a kettlebell overhead press, and I pretty much got like to a point where it was like it was like near like a meditation where I was just like really calm, breathing through my nose. And then all of a sudden I would I had to kind of warm a little bit on so I could just by taking a deep breath. So like, yeah. and just like that you can kind of you can kind of flip that switch with the nervous system as you get better and better at it. And then I would hit a set of like three trap bar deadlifts. Then I would immediately come back to breathing through my nose and try to turn that parasympathetic branch on again. So it's just kind of I was kind of flipping back between sympathetic and parasympathetic as fast as possible. Um, huge benefits for that would be uh, like if you're hunting, you're bow hunting, and you're you get that kind of stress response buck fever. Oh yeah. Um, Target panic. Everybody loves that. Everybody loves that. Right? Like it's a good feeling is that hormones hit your bloodstream. So it's a good feeling, but we just need to learn to control it, right? So you can actually still make the shot and still do what you need to do. Mm -hmm. So that'd be kind of a similar approach. So I would be letting that hormonal response, because when you're getting a stress response, um, there's the same kind of hormone response where you're getting the adrenaline, you're getting the cortisol on your veins. And you can learn to control that, or you can just learn to be controlled by it. So this form of, this form of training is like learning to control it. I got so you. I did that. So it's mostly you, breathing then. Like if you're in the stand, would it be yeah, a lot of um, breathing exercises, or what? What else would it involve? So it's. I guess you, there'd be probably three kind of three pillars. Would be like concentration would be the first one. So just kind of focusing. Um, and that's like can be kind of trained through like meditation, just like breath, mindfulness, focusing on your breath. Um, the second one is breathing techniques. So with this Wim Hof breathing technique, you can actually um, hyper oxygenate your body. So there's a certain level of oxygen that I think you can kind of take in, and they, this has kind of been proven to be able to take more oxygen than that in, and you're able to kind of hold your breath for a lot longer than normal. Um, you're able to up your metabolism 
up to like 300 percent is what Wynn was able to do. Damn, I'd like that. <laughs> yeah. So. So what, obviously benefits would be way less huge. So how do you hyper oxygenate yourself? I can just demo it. Um, I'll kind of talk through it and demo. It. Yeah, that'd be but, great. So the idea is to take as big of a breath in as possible, and then you want only you only want to let out what you need to. So it'd be a big breath in and kind of just relax. You don't want to force any air out, so you're forcing in and just relaxing out. So it looks like this. So it'd be a big breath in, and then just kind of relaxing out. So you're just you're kind of you're just up in the oxygen you take in your body, and you do like that for about 30, 30 rounds of breaths. And then you'd actually be able to hold your breath way longer afterwards. That's crazy. So you're expelling very little. Go ahead and give it a try. So you're expelling very little CO2. Um, you know, you're expelling very little oxygen. You're letting out whatever CO2 needs to come out. Okay. So, so the idea is that you keep as much oxygen as possible and let out all the CO2. So I do big inhale, right? How long should my exhale be? Yeah. So there should be a feeling where it becomes comfortable again. It's like I get that big inhale, and then I start letting it out, and I just relax and let it out a little bit, and then I inhale again once there's like enough air out. I guess enough would be when you you, you should get a feeling. Let me explain this better. You should get a feeling that there's a kind of a relaxed midpoint somewhere, and you'll have to kind of do it and get play with it a little bit, and you'll kind of feel where you, you run out of air. So it'll be like this. I don't know if you guys can hear my breathing. Oh, yeah. It's just I can, like that yeah. big. Okay, I'm gonna, cool. All right, I'm going to try this. You want to try it, Phil? You want to wanna play along with me? No, you go ahead, Will. All right. Go ahead and pop it. <laughs> You're really just trying to relax. Out. Big breath in. A little more out. And. And out. More in. And out. And you're thinking about letting a little bit more air come in every single breath. I feel it. I feel like I'm taking a lot more air in. And you can even do like a little breath. Yeah, you're going to get a little bit of like a, like a, an oxygen high from it. Too. Yeah, like I'm not like, 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 like it's it. not like I'm lightheaded, but my head feels light. You know what I mean? Like I don't feel woozy. My head just feels light. You got to try this. Yeah, it'll though. continue like that. <clears throat> well, I mean, isn't the body only capable of handling so much oxygen, though? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely only capable of handling a certain amount of oxygen. They have, like, different tests of, like, what is normal. Um, the idea is, like, the lung, there's only so much lung capacity, right? But when right. you bring that oxygen in your, your lungs, um, your heart pumps the blood through your lungs, and then the blood takes up the oxygen. So basically, you're just getting, you're taking more, more oxygen into the, into the blood. So it's not like you're just storing all this oxygen in your lungs all the time. It's going into your bloodstream. It's so when getting just constantly trying to get the, the, the muscles, the blood, the deep stuff, like the, the further capillary, just more oxygenated. It's an interesting concept that has there's a, a lot of research being done on it right now, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember watching some of the videos with Wim Hof, and I know he's been on a couple other podcasts that I've seen, and and uh. Yeah, I mean, it, there's been two, right? It, the, the thing where he taps into trying to, you know, identify other other issues within his body. That's where I'm. I'm kind of. <clears throat> how come more people can't do that? I guess is is, or, and, and maybe they just haven't practiced it properly, or they don't know exactly how to do it. But <clears throat> I'm of the opinion there's not a lot out there that hasn't been tried, or hasn't been tested, or hasn't been done. So where is it that this guy is, you know, uncracked this secret? And I, I'm just playing devil's advocate here because I, I, I think some of the stuff that he's done is, is awesome. And I, and I agree with a lot of the, you know, the, the cold showers or the, you know, that type of ice bath or whatever it is. I, I definitely think there's benefits there. But I'm just curious now, well, how come more people aren't really, um, from a medical, from the medical field, really... How come we don't see this in doctors? Office? How come we don't see this in, you know, physical therapy? Or is it? I mean, maybe, Josh, you can enlighten us a little bit there. Yeah, it's just the fact that it's so new. Um, so for the longest time, for hundreds of years, like all the medical textbooks have said, 
that the autonomic nervous system is completely automatic and we don't have any control over it. So everybody kind of assumed that that was a truth. It was like just a long held truth, like 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 maybe the, the Earth being flat a couple th or a thousand years ago. People commonly thought that the Earth was flat, so nobody kind of challenged that view. Um, but now, like this, this was like kind of one of the the big thing is like the exposure of cold, kind of meditation, concentration techniques, and breathing techniques. Um, those three kind those three things kind of working together um, are the the big deal, I guess. And there's there's been like one of the an old treatment for depression used to be cold baths. Like hundred years ago, when people had depression, cold baths was was a common treatment. So th these these things have kind of been used, but just not to the point that they're being used now. I think it's more of a lack of understanding. Everything's new now, so all the research is being done now. Um, and I guess yeah, so the new medical the new medical textbook are pretty much agreeing that this is completely possible. You know, if you think about it though, there's companies out there who have a vested interest in you know self help, self healing you know, taking care of yourself without drugs or anything like that. They have a vested interest in it, staying the way it is, in this new stuff not, you know, making its way through. Yeah, um, I think things just take time moving through the medical system, too. I'm not saying there's not, like, people that make money off of it, not having it around. Um, but I think things just take time to get, like, the science behind it before people actually use it. Like, for example, in the fitness industry, um, it's it commonly said that like the medical field and the research is about ten years behind the practice. Um, so there's like there's a lot of people that are using what they call use stress training, which has been pretty common since like the seventies, eighties, and like Russia and Bul Bulgaria and stuff like that. And basically, like this is just like the idea would be use stress versus distress. Like use stress being like a positive stress, so you're never getting over like 150 beats per minute in your heart, or you're only breathing through your nose. And like distress would be like the common metabolic workouts we see here where you're doing some high intensity interval training or you're doing a bunch of reps till your arms hurt or you can't lift anymore, you know? So this is this is being commonly used and it's still highly used with like a lot of special forces and stuff like that. Hmm. So what is out of all these things, what's your favorite thing to incorporate into your training? Yeah. Um it's a multifaceted approach, you know, so for the most part, my workouts are going to be pretty similar to a lot of people's where I'm doing, like, a lot of full-body workouts, um, some high-intensity interval stuff. Um, I like to mix in, like, I do some kickboxing and yoga, too, so I mix those in, but those are mostly, like, high-intensity interval stuff. Um, but I do, like, a cold shower every morning along with a couple rounds of breathing that we kind of went over earlier. And a little, like, meditation stuff in the evening, so just kind of... And then I'll have maybe one day a week where I do use stress training. So an example of a use stress training workout would be uh, I would take maybe like a back squat and do 50 reps, but they're all like 50 sets of one rep. So maybe I, I'd take like 60 sets of my max, and then like the challenge would be to breathe exclusively through my nose. So I'd get about 65% of my max and try to do 50 reps of one. So maybe I'm doing like 265, 275 on back squat, and I'm doing 50 rep or 50 sets of one rep by breathing only through my nose and keeping my heart under 150 beats per minute. And the benefits here would be the ability to recover way faster. Um, you'd be able to get a lot more reps in at closer to your maximal strength. So, for example, if I was going to do, like, back squat, and, like, I was going to do five to five, maybe I could only do, like, 315 or something like that. But then if I drop back another 10, 15% and take my time in between reps, and I keep it completely use stress. I'm only breathing through my nose. I'm really focusing on that parasympathetic nervous system. So I'm not allowing the stress to kind of overtake me. Hmm. So the idea would be maybe I get five to five, I can get 25 reps at, you know, 275, and then I could do 50 to one at the same, at the same rate. So I get twice as many reps at that, that higher weight. So it would improve my strength faster. I'm going to improve in hypertrophy. I'd be able to add size quicker, and I'd be able to recover and work out again the next day. I could hit U-stress on a back squat one day and go hit legs again the next day. So I don't want to get change the topic too quickly here, Will, because I, I, I think that I, I'm just let, – let's back up a little bit because we're getting kind of in-depth with with a specific, you know, specific – Tell us more. So, so from start to finish, you got into 
uh, becoming a trainer, but why why focus on the hunting athlete or the hunting the hunters? What's what's the, what was your thought process reasoning, or how did you get from you know athletics or, or school or, or really focusing on on the hunter for for training? Because that that seems like that's what what you you try to cater to mostly. Am I wrong there? No, you're correct. It's a really good question. So, um, so it, it's kind of an interesting story, actually. So, um, for the longest time, like ever since I was little, my dad always had like a weight set, a power rack, and he'd always be downstairs lifting, doing his thing, and he's always a bow hunter, hunter as well. So my whole life, I was around both of those things. And then, like as far back as I can remember, my dad always had this back pain, and like he'd, he'd always like he'd be not be able to go to work or he'd just work through the pain or whatever it was. And over time, it's getting worse and worse. And he's always left. He's always left an ass. He's always going working hard. And eventually, it reached the point where, like, one day in bed, like four or five, maybe I don't know how many years ago, four years ago now. But he just kind of rolled over awkwardly in bed, and he he slipped a disc in his upper back. So he he went to some physical therapists. He went to some chiropractors, some surgeons, and the, the kind of the solution that he got was that he's going to have to get surgery. Um, and at the, at the same point, I've been working as a personal trainer, so I kind of had a, I had a good feel for the corrective exercise way of doing things, which was still relatively new and not a lot of people knew about it at that point. Um, it was being done in some physical therapist place, but a lot more rare in gyms. But anyway, so he had this rounded upper back, which is known as kyphosis, and the rounding kind of forced the disc to come out. So the idea was just to kind of fix the muscular imbalances and it would fix his posture and he would reduce pain. He'd be able to do everything he wanted to get. It did just go back in. So we worked at that for a few months to fix his back. Um, there's that I've been training him and it's been a few years now and he's like stronger than me now. Uh, like perfect posture, no back pain. And he's kind of just crushing it. And I just, I also had an uncle was in a similar situation where he's having back pain and he was like, as a hunter as well. And I kind of, the more I paid attention to it, the more I realized that like, there was a lot of focus on quantity for fitness for hunters. Like, can you walk to the top of the mountain or can you not? It was kind of the question. Can you pack that elk out or can you not? Um, but there wasn't real focus on movement quality. So the quality of the approach is what I kind of wanted to bring in. So bringing in, like, functional movement screens, um, different, different self-assessments so you can kind of check your own posture and having, like, corrective exercises that will fix that problem so that you, you feel good when you're doing all your workouts too. It's not just something you have to kind of – get it out and finish um to kind of fix it from the quality of respect and with a lot of hunters at the gym you know just kind of people that i really like to work with something i have a lot of fun common with josh we're still getting a little bit of scratch out of you do you want to try maybe losing the headset yeah we can do that can you hear a baby crying in the background, by the way? I do, yes. Can, can you give him his pacifier, sweetie? There we go. All right, how's this sound now? Better, way better. That's nice. Okay, perfect. So did you get that last story, or should I kind of retell Let's it? Let's retell it, and I'll edit it back. Okay, cool. Hopefully we're hopefully we're good to go now. Actually you sound okay. louder too, so that's probably better. Yeah. Perfect. All right. And go. All right, so how I got into working with hunters, fitness for hunters, um, was basically through my dad. Uh as far back as I can remember, my dad's been super into fitness, always lift in, um, just kinda always trying to get a little bit stronger, always doing like squats, bench, whatever else it was, all the big compound lifts. Um, other than like deadlift, because he thought deadlift would hurt his back because he always had back pain. Um, and over time, he just kind of got the back pain continued to get worse and worse. And he was he was always working out, always hitting the weights, like always doing what you're supposed to do, you know, or what people think they're supposed to do. And he just wasn't getting the results he should have gotten. His posture was just getting worse, and his back pain was just getting worse. Um, so at at the time, I was kind of working as a personal trainer. I found like a really good gym to work at where. We were super in depth with like corrective exercise, movement screens, assessments, stuff like that. So I was working there, and I had I had a guy teaching me how to do all that stuff, and I was kind of learning it and using it on my own clients. And 
I ended up just kind of taking my dad on and, and working with his upper back. He had some kyphosis, like some upper back rounding. So over time, we just we worked on that. So we loosened up his pecs, we loosened up his, the front of his chest, his lats, all that stuff while kind of strengthening the scapula stabilizer, so the rhomboids, lower scap, stuff like that. And he just got his posture improved. The, the disc problem wasn't giving him any pain anymore. He's getting way stronger. So we started working on a lot more strength workouts. And fast forward a few years, and now he's, like, stronger than me, crushing all his workouts. His posture is, like, better than mine, like, really, really good. And he doesn't have any back pain. And about six, nine months ago, I was, like, I started to notice this was really common with a lot of other hunters as well. Uh, my my uncle, for example, is having similar back problems. He's been a hunter his whole life, kind of been in the fitness a little bit as well. Um, but there was just always this huge focus on quantity from the fitness realm, and there wasn't real fo- like much of a focus on quality. And I think that's the biggest thing that I'm trying to change is just focusing on the quality of movement, so making sure the movements are done right and then loading them and then getting strong and then getting conditioned. So um, – one of the, my favorite quotes is by Greg Cook. It's, it's don't load dysfunction. So it's fixing the movement patterns first, and then you load them, or else you're just kind of going to ingrain it as dysfunction. So I worked with some hunters at, at the gym I was working at for a while, too, and then I just kind of decided that I was going to take it online, and I wrote a book about it, and I just had great turnout. People have been getting fantastic results and just loving it. So then is, is your training – are you still doing a lot of uh... – Actual, I mean, actual clients at, at, your, at where you're located at, as well as online, or is it the is the the book kind of just a a training guide, and then you just do your your clients where you where you live? Yes. So up until about uh, last winter, it was all in person. I didn't do anything online, um, and then I, I took a little bit of a leave so I could kind of write the book. It takes a lot of time to write the book. Developing like I developed an, an app for training and nutrition. Um, recorded exercises of all the video demos and just kind of set up like a whole like comprehensive coaching program. So I'm taking some time away from the gym right now and I'll probably get back into that within the next six months or so. So it's kind of all focusing online and like training people remotely. Cause you, with this, with this approach, you kind of get a lot more like 168 hours a week. You can kind of help people. So you can help through the nutrition. You can help with the sleep schedule. You can help with the stress. You can help with the training instead of just having them a few hours a week. Because like as a person, when you have so many PRs a week, there's only so much change you can really make. You don't really have any control over anything else than when you have them there. There's no way to really regulate it, so it's kind of like a problem I was trying to fix. So that when I do go back to like in-person training, I can just bring all this kind of all these apps, this nutrition. I'm, I'm building a nutrition curriculum right now too, so all this stuff that'll kind of carry over with both. So then, when you're talking with people that that are coming to you for online for, for online consultations or, or training or advice, are you seeing that it's more is is it any is there any rhyme or reason to what part of the country you're seeing people or is it just kind of scattered? I mean, I'm I'm just no, curious. Man, it, I guess the reason I ask is a lot of hunters that you know the the mountains are this mystical creature to come hunt the west and you know it's just it's the it's the draw of of that type of hunt to where people that are coming from the Midwest or the East, they want to, they know it's going to be a ch- more challenging hunt. Are they, are they, those people seeking you more or is it people in your backyard that are, you know, that are looking for you? Um, I've had a couple clients from Montana. Um, I've had clients from like, I have a couple clients right now from New Zealand. Um, I'd say the majority of my clients are from like Washington, Oregon, Northern California. Um, for the most part, that's where like the majority of them come from. But uh-huh. honestly, like when the book came out, like it was bought pretty much all over the country. People on the East Coast, people in the Midwest, probably a lot less in the Midwest and kind of South, but mostly West Coast, Rocky Mountains area, and for some reason, New Zealand's pretty popular as well. A lot of hunting over there too, I guess. Yeah, it's always interesting to see like what part of uh, you know if there's any rhyme or reason to it. Because I guess I, I mean, us Western hunters that go hunt, they go east to hunt. I don't do anything different myself, you know, in preparation, but guys that that come West or girls, you know, I mean, nothing against women hunters, but they, that sometimes there's always a, you know, am I, am I really doing it right? Am I going to be prepared? Um, you know, the uncertainty if they haven't come out to hunt out West. Yeah, definitely. And I've heard from a lot of guide services as well. It's a big problem that people will come out for, you know, a week long elk hunt and they can't hike let alone put a heavy pack on their back and hike around. 
So it's a, the fitness is, is a pretty big struggle with people that are coming from somewhere outside of the Rocky Mountains. Somewhere they're not in the elevation, they're not used to the hiking in like rough terrain or hiking steep terrain. And they end up with like a lot of knee pain, a lot of back pain. Pain's a huge thing. It kind of keeps people from um, enjoying their hunts that they pay a lot of money for, I guess. And so it's a big thing to be able to improve that. So, so then I guess I, I've got another question too for you then. As far as your opinion, uh, being based in the West, you know, hunt, being a hunter, is there, and I obviously I, I think I know the answer to this, but I'm just curious to your take on it. There, there's guys that really focus on hitting the weights. There's guys that really focus on running trails and, and people that do everything between, you know, CrossFit or what have you. What, what does your programming look like? Is it a blend of everything? Is it, is it very specific to the, to the, the body type of the person or, or what well, for optimal operation for a western style hunter what, where, where do you focus most of your attention when you're training somebody um so it's going to depend a lot on the goals so like in my in my book um mountain fit the hunter fitness solution we had a i typically work with the four-day split that i really like so i'd be like two full body weight training days where you're doing like some big compounds um focusing on different kind of corrective exercises, dynamic warm-ups, really movement quality first. Um, so then there'd be like two full body weight days per week, one day where you're doing like kind of the CrossFit style where you're doing like more so high intensity intervals and some core work. And then I try to, if possible, I try to get somebody to do like a weighted pack workout once a week too when they're kind of in that last couple of months leading up to the actual hunt just to get that specific physical preparedness ready. So it's a little bit of a combination. I think the, the biggest thing that I do differently is that I have, like, I teach people how to, in my personal clients, I assess them, but I teach people, like, for my book, I talk to people how to assess themselves, so how to assess their pelvis orientation to see if they had, like, an anterior pelvic tilt that was causing their lower back pain, which is incredibly common. Like, some, like 80% of people have an anterior pelvic tilt, and we're around the same number have lower back pain. And I teach people how to assess their shoulder mobility and their breathing patterns. And with, with those things, I figured in, those are the three biggest things in my, from my book that could really like, kind of change people's outlook on fitness because then you get them to start feeling good. And then you can really open the door to that, like the quantity aspect of it, so strength and conditioning. And at that point, it's just getting a lot of big bang for your buck exercises into a workout and being consistent with it and getting a little bit of long-distance long cardio, a little bit of like high-intensity cardio, and just kind of getting that good combination, like you said. Yeah, so the, I, I've I've looked at your website some and and read some of the the readings on there and and uh, just I guess the general overview. I've not I've not had a chance to read your book, but um, a- average guy. Let's just say that I'm I'm average Joe that I, I want to get in a little better shape and I want to be a little bit better for hunting, but I I've got a full time job. I've got kids. I've got you know the whole nine yards. I'm still trying to practice with my bow, for example. How much time do you do you are you recommending for people to plan to, to, to be prepared for, you know, and, and let's say that we've got a couple months to, to get ready for season. Yeah, man. It's, um, it obviously depends on where you're at when you start and like how much weight you need to lose and where you need to, what kind of hunt you're going to do. But for the most part, let's just say your guy who needs to lose 10 pounds or 10, 10 to 15 pounds or something like that. You're a little overweight. You're not in great shape. Um, and you're going to be doing a, an elk hunt in the Rocky is not like something super crazy. You're not going, person sheep way up in Alaska or anything like that, but average guy getting ready for a, a pretty tough elk hunt. Um, I don't think you really need more than three, four hours a week. Um, you could do it in four hours a week, and it's, it's one of those things where there's kind of like a diminishing return on how many hours you put in. So the, the big rule that I tried to follow in the book was like the 80-20 rule. So basically 20% of your actions re- get 80% of your results. Um, and this is kind of like, it's called Pareto's Law. It's, an, it's a big, big rule on like entrepreneurship and stuff like that right now. But so it's kind of just picking the, the, the few things that we can do that are going to give you the biggest results. Um, so we're not going to be spending any time on machines. We're not going to be, I guess one of the things that that's why I cut jogging out completely from that program. Because jogging takes a long time and it doesn't give that much of a metabolic um, effect. So you're not going to burn a lot of weight. You're not going to be getting the greatest endurance gains. That's where like, high intensity interval training would come in because you would get a similar workout in 10, 15 minutes than you would with like 45 minutes of jogging. Yeah, my view on jogging has always been running 
long distances slowly only really make you good at running long distances slowly. Couldn't say that better, man. And it helps that I don't enjoy running much. <laughs> Same here. <laughs> It's good that it's not necessary, I guess. Yeah, not a lot I'm, of people prepare without it. Yeah, I'm no yeah, film, I'm sure film you Mendoza, well. you know, engines for days. Well, the the thing is, is that I I agree, right? I and and there's I can't run a lot a lot of distance for long periods of time, and, and what I mean by that is I can't go for five or six months in a row with you know three to four days a week running, you know a lot of miles. I can't do that for long periods of time. But the one thing I will yeah. say is when I have made it a point to really focus on that side of training, there's a lot of suck that goes involved with that, right? It's just it just it's it's boring, it's tedious, it sucks, but but when you when you come out on the back end of that, from the gains that that you get from a mental side of things, a mental toughness point of point of view, um I think are worth it in many cases. You know, I, I agree with you. If if you're on a time crunch, yeah, it's probably you're not going to get the bang for your buck. But if you've got a little bit more time, or you want to really make it a point, I can't discount the value of just getting out myself. And I'm not, you know, I, I I was I was many moons ago, like 15, 16 years ago, certified as a personal trainer, and I and I I, I did it for a year. But out of college, I just I'm so far disconnected from current and, and new and modern training methods and, and you know, the, the new of the new, I guess. But I can tell you that just from a standpoint of developing mental toughness and, and sometimes those long pack outs with, with meat and, you know, hiking out of a place that just really sucks, that's when I, I think you can draw from some of those uh, so, some of those type of workouts that, like, well, like you said, well, they're, they're only some of those are really only good for one thing, but actually, it's probably more like two things because from from building your uh, building your mental, you know, capacity f to to deal with a lot of the the crap, the 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 hard part of, of hunting the mountains. I think that's where I I would say the the biggest benefit is. Yeah, there's that. Yeah, week. absolutely. I think. There's that week I spent running six to ten miles, or that month I spent running every, like, six days a week I was running six to ten miles a day. And I don't really think it upped my fitness ability for the amount of time I spent doing it. But I'll tell you what, as far as mental toughness go and feeling like I could run any distance, by the end of the month it was like ten miles. I don't give it. That doesn't phase me one yeah. bit, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, that's that's what I'm saying. I but agree it, with that. But it only and, made me better physically at running long, slow distance or long distances slowly. You know. What do you do for the mental yeah, think, side of training with your programming, Josh? What, I mean, do, do you add any of that into it, or you just kind of hope that the programming and the workouts that you've done have uh, will in turn develop some of that with your clients? Yeah. So mental mental toughness is obviously it's a huge part of hunting. That's one of the it's a, it's a huge component, and that's kind of like what I was getting into with the nervous system stuff. I don't think I explained that well enough. Um, it's going to kind of lead us back to that. But I think jogging is a good way to build mental toughness. But at the same time, it's also it's taking a lot of time to do it. So like it's, it's, we're still in that time thing, and we're still in this, we're doing this repetitive range of motion that's not really good for your body at all, especially if you're not moving really well already. If you don't have a, a good movement quality, like you, you can't do a full squat, good technique, your knees aren't working right, your pelvis isn't right, your shoulders aren't right. Um, at that point, then you're sacrificing um, the function of your body for a little bit of gains in mental toughness, which is something that some people would, are willing to do, and, it's, and it can work for some people. Um, I have several other ways of training mental toughness. For example, um, getting in a cold shower right when you wake up in the morning is definitely not the easiest thing to do. So that in and of itself is going to build a lot of mental toughness. But I think I kind of have a theory on mental toughness and like what it really is. I think it's the ability to absorb a stress and not let it dictate your um, your actions in response to it. Does that make sense to you guys? Oh, I, I agree. Oh, and, yeah. and and even specifying making decisions, right? Like you say, your actions your actions can be physically, but in the moment of of truth, you might be it might be in a hunting situation, like you said, in a high pressure hunting situation. So the decisions you're going to make before you even move. 
um, could relate to, to just that. So, yeah, I, I, that, I think that's a great definition. It is. It is cool, because cool. It's, it's not just about how long you can sit comfortably in the pain cave, right, in a workout, but also relates to that if you're freezing in a deer stand or um, – you're thinking, man, I need to move somewhere else. It's that mental toughness to to believe in everything you've set up to do. Yeah. So I guess yeah, the definition like that's a huge thing about it because everybody talks about mental toughness when it comes to hunting and fitness, but there's not there's never like a whole lot of like this is what mental toughness is. And I think if we can define it, then we can talk about how we can train it. Yeah, you have so, to be able to define I, it. Yeah, absolutely. So I like I would say like my definition is. You get this stress, regardless of what it is, your body's going to handle all this stress the same way. You're going to get this hormonal response. And once you have this hormonal response, it's going to make you want to panic. It's going to make you want to quit. It's going to make you want to stop. How can you, instead of re- reacting in that way, by just whatever you feel like doing, how can you um, take in that stress and then adjust at the mental, the mental level to have a different outcome, to make a different action, to, to respond instead of to react? And that's the thing. It's you become what you what you constantly do, right? If yeah. you constantly sit on the couch and eat nothing but potato chips and pies, your body's going to reflect that. Your mind's going to reflect that. If you are working out like crazy through the pain, through this, dealing with a bunch of stress, you know, handling it, that's what your body's going to reflect. Yeah, and so, yeah, so now that we have like, the mental toughness definition, so like, how would I train it? Um, it goes back to that, we kind of talked about the autonomic nervous system and the parasympathetic versus sympathetic branch. So when you're getting that stress, what, what's happening is this hormonal response comes in your body. It's, it's saying activate fight or flight system. So you want to fight or you want to flight. Sorry, my dog just ran into my room. But So you're in this fight or flight response, right? And, and now it's, it's calming your nerves, controlling yourself to the point where you can get, get back maybe into that you stress where it's a good stress where you're not in, that, not in the distress, like, I don't know what to do, I can't handle this. So it's, it's learning how to get, into that, get to that point when you get that stress response and how to handle it in the most efficient way to keep going. Um, and that's where the, the nervous system stuff comes in. That's, like, that's why I do that completely. So the cold showers, the breathing techniques, the meditation techniques, um, the kind of jumping back in from, like, explosive movements into kind of relaxing as quick as possible learning how to control the, the response to the cold shower. Because when you have freezing water in your face, and that's like kind of what I'm doing. I can like turn the water down all the way, which is real cold over here in Montana. You can have it hitting you in the face, and you can just kind of sit there and focus on your breathing or focus on your heart rate. That's the point where you're at a point of mental toughness where there's not a lot of things that can, can affect your decision-making there. Yeah, I had a actually a couple of weeks ago right before trying to hunt, I, I – uh, my hot water heater in the house went out, and I spent about four days taking cold showers. And it was it, by like the once I finally got the thing fixed, I was kind of enjoying the cold showers a little bit. You know, it was like, yeah, eh, you know, uh, and and I had played around with hot cold type shower treatment stuff before, but I never really. It wasn't like every day for an eight to 10 minute shower, it was just, you know, some hot, some cold for, for periodization. And then, and then I, you know, get out of the shower, but having to just suck it up and deal with it. Like I said, by the end of that, by, by the time I got it fixed, I was like, yeah, I think I might still just keep doing the cold shower thing now and then, because like I said, it, it's almost like your body, it's funny how your body sometimes craves certain things or it, it, it wants certain things. And I felt like it, it, it wanted, it enjoyed that, or it benefited from that. Phil, you sandbagging yeah, you son can. of a bitch. That's how you won Train to Hunt Colorado, huh? It, it's, it's, it was divine <laughs> intervention. Somebody kind of magically jacked up my hot water heater, and, and, uh, and it worked out for the best. Jeez, <laughs> Perfect. People. It's funny how that works. <laughs> so, yeah, I guess I would say mental toughness is as much of a physiological response of the body than it is of the brain. Because if you think about what the brain really is, it's basically this, this computer that's connected to your nervous system, that's connected to all your muscles, everything in your body. So it's, it's basically the mainframe computer for your entire body. So if you can learn to handle the stress in your body, if you can, if you can handle the stress happening in your body, um, it, it's going to improve your mental strength. And if you can 
get better with from the mental side of things, it's going to improve your ability to handle the stress to your body as well. So you can kind of you can approach it from both points, whether you're just trying to improve like mentally and kind of physically, I guess you'd say. So getting used to breathing is, is the example I'd use. So if you, if you can maintain your breath, if you don't have to panic breathe and start like huffing, huffing and chest breathing, which is a sign of the sympathetic response, if you can take a big stress, if you can take cold water and still deep breathe in through your nose, into your belly, and breathe out your mouth, you can make, if you can control your breath, you can control mental response to anything. And that's, a, that's a, like a pretty firm belief that I hold. Yeah, no, I, I think there's something to it, man. Like I said, there's there's guys, you know, Ben Greenfield has been a, a, a frequent visitor of this show, and he's he seems like he's big on it, and um, you know, the guy, guys like yourself, you know, and then and then focusing on uh, or or applying the Wim Hof method and and knowing where he's going with that, I definitely agree. There's something to that. Like I said earlier in the show, I was just trying to kind of play devil's advocate as to. I mean, obviously, that seems like there's something to it, but 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 it makes sense. Like like you said, that it, it it takes time to do studies, it takes time to test, it takes time to apply certain, uh, um, you know, thought reason reasoning, I should say, as to why something works or how it works with some person, and make sure they're just not an anomaly, and uh, and and start to 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 study it and learn it. So ho- hopefully. You're right. Maybe maybe it's three years, five years down the road that that you go into a doctor's office and and they're telling you to strip down and get in a cold shower and, and work on breathing techniques. You know, who knows? Yeah, yeah. yeah and I mean, I think yeah, I think the the placebo effect already kind of demonstrates the power of the brain to kind of heal the body. And people think if people think people can take a sugar pill, and and if they think it's going to cure them, their brain will do the rest and cure them. You know, that's sure. been demonstrated over and over again. I, I agree. I I know I've, I've met some people or I've known some people, friends, family, and that kind of stuff. That it, it seems like, it, today's day and age, everything comes easy. Everybody wants it fast. Nobody has to suffer in for anything, and people start to get weak in a lot of ways with, you know, with Absolutely. just life. Yeah. And and instead of you know saying you know what this is hard, it sucks. You know, I've got to, I've got to work through it. I've got to figure out a way. And mentally, you just start getting yourself in the right mindset to overcome a hurdle. And that's, that's the biggest, that's the biggest part of the, the, the obstacle is just getting your mind right to, to say that you can go get over it, not just dealing with, you know, the easy way out of sitting back on the couch and eating another bag of potato chips. Yeah, that ability to kind of handle that adversity and overcome it. I think that's a huge point to all growth, especially when you get like the philosophical side of it is like the ability to take adversity in any situation, something that you thought was a bad situation and, and either learn from it or turning it into a good situation, something that you can learn from. It's a great book called The Obstacles Away by Ryan Holiday. It's completely about that. Yeah, it seems like, uh, you know, everybody read the book that says everybody needs to get a medal and, you know, slap each other on the butt and, and, and nobody needs to be, you know, real or, uh, you know, tell the truth anymore. It just, you know, sugarcoat everything. Everybody can get a can get by, and we can all sing kumbaya and and whatever. And and it it seems like, like I said, it just seems like we're our society is turning into a bunch of pansies. I mean, that's what yeah. it seems like. I think we're accepting less. trophies and such. Yeah, we're accepting less. We're accepting lower standards now. Like yeah. the whole, and this might get me in some trouble, but every body, no matter your size, you know, where it's a healthy body, it's a beautiful body. It's like bullshit. No, it's I not. Agree. No, it's not. You're fucking two seconds away from diabetes, and when you walk, you jiggle like the fucking Kool Aid man. You know, like <laughs> that's it's not good. I don't know how to tell you, other than you know. Do you want to lo- live a long, healthy life where you're not a burden on your kids or whoever, right? Well, and that's that's yeah. exactly it. it. It's it's okay when somebody says, "Oh yeah, you don't have to worry. You look great. You're beautiful as you are." If you want to live till you're 50, if you want to potentially live till you're 70, 80 plus, then you better fix something and and change your lifestyle and 
and and figure it out because you know i don't know with with as much knowledge and technology and everything that we have now you know it, assuming you don't don't have an accident or something doesn't happen that you know get struck by lightning get hit by a car assuming that you you make it past the the percentages there and you just live your life and the 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 length of your life is directly going to correlate based off what how you tr- take care of your body and how you live your life with you know from a physical and and mental and everything standpoint there's no reason why people shouldn't live till they're in their 90s re- you know a lot more now there's just so much there's so much more that's been studied. There's so much more that's been uh, that can be applied. I mean, for crying out loud, they're starting to you know in take your cells and, and recreate you know the tissue for your you know a, a meniscus. So you, I mean, you can take your own cells and they can make that crap in a lab. You know, if if you've got knee problems, it, it, as much stuff has been it has been learned and studied. Like I said, the only excuse is you. If if there's an excuse, it's because you want to be lazy and, and you're accepting being lazy. Let me let me put this question to you. Would you rather live to eighty, right, and you're living a full, healthy, mobile, independent life, right? You're active, you're doing all this stuff, right? You know, you're healthy. Or would you rather live to like ninety five, but from the age of like sixty on? You're on a lot of medications. You're not that mobile. You know, you're in a wheelchair in a home or whatever, but you're you're living longer. No, it's quali- it's longer. it's got to be quality of life, man. It's got to be quality of life. Yeah, that's the, that's the answer there. I think it's uh because we talk a lot about quantity and like living longer, but there's a very very direct correlation to your fitness levels, your body's ability to function and perform, and just like have a quality high quality of life based on being in shape being active, eating properly, just your energy levels, the way you're going to feel on a day-to-day basis, regardless, even if you live to the same exact age, you know, there's a huge difference in how you're going to feel from a day-to-day basis. I think, uh, I think the big thing that leads to it is like, if you look at like our society as a whole, it's like we're moving more and more towards efficiency. And that's kind of, that's all technology is, right? It's just like we're moving towards efficiency. Like it used to be if me, if the three of us wanted to go talk, we had to meet up and go talk somewhere. That's a way bigger challenge. Now we can all just hop on Skype or hop on the phone and we can talk, which is which is great. It gives us a lot of opportunities as well, but it also just makes things easier. And we have cars that make it, make it easier to get around. We can drive. We don't have to walk. So all these things that the human body is kind of designed to do, it doesn't it's not doing anymore, right? right? And we have to actively seek these challenges instead of them just being there in our environment that we have to overcome. Right. And, you know, I saw today – I think it was CrossFit Facebook posted in like the CrossFit Journal or something. They shared this video and it was a dude. He's like 72 years old and he's coaching what he's calling, I think it's like their longevity class at a CrossFit box where everyone's like 55 years or older. They have like a guy who's like 92 or 93 in there. And I mean, they're not doing these full blown CrossFit workouts, but they're in there doing workouts scaled to their abilities and they're pushing themselves and they're getting stronger and more mobile and all this. And now that I've started coaching, it's like, man, I really want to get one of these classes in our box because I want people to be able to live longer, healthier in independent lives on their terms. Absolutely, man. That's a huge motivational thing. It's like if, as long as it, like workouts can be scaled for anybody, man. It's like anybody who's still alive can work out in some some way or some fashion. You know, even if it's like even if you're sitting like if you're 80 years old and you're sitting down on a chair and then standing up or on one step and slowly trying to control your way down as you step down. There's always something you can do, and like just doing anything, burning any kind of energy, is going to improve your quality of life. You're going to be so, a more energetic so then, person. You're going to enjoy your life better. Kind of speaking to that, then now, so so let's. Let's talk to the to the hunting community that's that's potentially in their upper forties, fifties, or even sixties, right? That mm-hmm. that they're starting to have uh, they're starting to have second thoughts. They're starting to man, I don't know how much longer I can do this. Or you know, it, it, Josh, give me give me a couple. Uh, help, let, let's squash a couple misconceptions potentially, or let you know, give a couple tips that you might say. Hey, if you just start with this, then 
you know, uh, it'll help you potentially from a longevity standpoint or a mobility standpoint. Is, do you have a couple, you know, quick things that you say, hey, you know what, don't sit in a chair so much. Get up and, you know, uh, try to have a standing day or whatever the case is. Do you have anything that people can implement into their, their normal lives that, uh, that would help them just with that, that longevity, you know, to, to be able to basically for the end result being able to maybe, like I said, as hunters, continue to hunt longer? Yeah, absolutely, man. So I'd say I mean, we can start with nutrition here too. So like the first thing, like one big thing is like eat slower, you know, because it takes it takes about 20 minutes for your satiety mechanism to kick in from the signal signal from the gut to the brain that you're full. So you can eat a shit ton of food in 20 minutes, man. So if you're if you're sitting there and you're munching down a bunch of food, I'm a pro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, if your goal is fat loss, man, and you're eating fast you're not going to achieve that goal because you can eat as much as you want in that 15, 20 minute window. So an, an idea would be like, you want one thing, put your fork down and take a breath between each bite. And just, if you were to do that one thing, it's like one habit you could change and just do that for the next two to four weeks. And I don't think anybody can do that and come back and they're trying to lose weight and tell me they didn't lose any weight. It's something as simple as that. Like not even worried about, um, what you, even what kind of food you're eating, what quality of food, just eat slower. That's one of the first things I start with when I'm when I'm training nutrition. So eat slower, then it'd be like eat till eighty percent full and you know, teach people how to eat uh, understand when they're when they're full but they're not stuffed. Eat till you're full. Don't eat or don't you don't have to be completely stuffed or completely full. You can just be satisfied, you know? Um yeah. from a training perspective, it's just focus on quality, man. Don't just do the same repetitive of motions over and over again. The first thing is just do something. Like a lot of people think that they have to do you know, go to the gym for an hour or get on the treadmill for a half hour or go load up a barbell and do back squats. It's just start. Don't be afraid of starting where you are. Like don't bring your ego with you into training. You might, you might have accomplished everything. You might run a company. You might be a CEO. You might be, have a super successful family life, great relationships. But if you haven't been doing anything from a fitness point of view, it, it's going to reflect it. There's, there's no line. There's dishonesty. When you, when you go, if you're going to go try to pick up a barbell because you have a big ego and think you can lift 300 pounds, you're not going to, you're not going to, most people aren't going to do it. Most of the people are going to end up with injuries from that. So, I mean, instead of trying to load up a bar and put it on your back, pick a light dumbbell and find a box that's about maybe knee height and squat down to your butt touches the box and stand up, you know, start small and over time work your way up, progress up and up. So always pick the thing, think of the thing that you think you can do and take two steps back and then do that thing. Yeah. Like you said, more, most people, they just, especially if they haven't been working out for a while, the, oh, I used to do this when I was, you know, 10, 15 years younger. They try to start with that and get hurt, and then there they are sitting on the sidelines again. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So just starting, start light, start small. Um, maybe, yeah, make 10 minutes to exercise, you know. Do some body weight squats um, with a couple other small things, you know. Do some body weight squats, some jumping jacks, and just do that for five minutes a day. If you're not doing anything now, start somewhere and, like, go for a walk. Something as simple as that. If you're going for a walk every evening, your fitness level, and you, and you don't do any kind of fitness at this point, going for a walk is going to dramatically improve your health, your fitness, um, your preparedness to even be in the mountains to keep hunting. What do you think one of the biggest people, one of the biggest mistakes people make with their training is? Uh, focusing on quantity over quality. So, but that would be loading dysfunction. So not getting an appropriate movement screen or understanding how to move properly before they try to move a lot. So it's just a huge factor. So somebody can go try to load up their squat and squat more and more, but their, their knees are coming way forward and they're coming up on their toes in the bottom of the squat and maybe their lower backs rounding. They're just exposing themselves to all these injuries. So even if they are capable and they do get strong and they keep progressively overloading and get stronger and stronger, there's a weak link in their chain. They're doing it wrong. So something's bound to snap. Something's bound to happen, and you're just going to get reset, and you have to come back from it, and you're going to be overcoming an injury. So, yeah, just focusing on quality. Um, yeah, learn how to squat properly. Learn how to hinge, bend at the, bend at the hips without rounding your back. Uh, learn how to press without shrugging your shoulders to your, to your ears. Just little things like that. If you can find somebody who can do like a functional movement screen or some kind of an assessment to if you're actually going to start loading movements, Make sure you get them right first. It's interesting you mentioned that because for the uh, fundamentals, or some people call them AMRAP 
on-ramp classes at the uh, box I'm coaching at. I've actually, I'm talking about starting to add some movement screening to the beginning of the class, like first day stuff. We go through the new person with a movement screening just to get the baseline of what we're working with. Yeah, good idea, man. Definitely. Um, there, there's a couple ways to approach the screening, too. It's uh, Some people like to just do the, the screen at the, the first day, put them through a movement screen, like either they pass the screen or they fail, or they have a certain number, they can kind of give them some corrective exercises based on that, which is which is more so my approach, because I don't necessarily see my clients every day. Um, but a lot of people, like especially across the gyms where you're going to have people coming in and training with you, you can like do a couple of assessments every day, too. Like if you're going to be doing a front squat day, you can be like, okay, who can get their – who can get into rack position. If you can't get into rack position, you're going to do a goblet squat instead. You're going to hold a dumbbell. Yeah. So you're but, still going to get a training effect, but either you can do the movement or you can't. Oh, yeah, and that front rack position is so hard for a lot of guys. A lot of guys have problems getting that front rack position. Yeah, absolutely. They get, they get super tight, super tight in the lats, super tight in the triceps, super tight in the wrist. Everything's just tight, and it's hard to kind of reach – yeah, yeah, I, w I was there in the beginning. I had, you know, if I could get a front rack where my elbows would come in front of the bar, I was having a good day, you know? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I've been there too, man. I'd like The reason I'm so into that correct exercise and, and movement quality now is I've been through so many injuries, like completely de derailed my, like, football career, like ACLs, hamstring pulls, hip flexor pulls, any just about any, like, muscular problem you can name, I... I did it because I had all the problems. Like I had the hips, I had the anterior pelvic tilt where my, I had this huge arch in my lower back. I had my shoulders rounded forward and it just, and I went and tried to get really strong in every workout, like my lower back would hurt and I would just try to work through it. Cause you know, everybody coaches you how tough and you, how you need to be mentally tough. But if you're having pain when you're training, it's not the time to be mentally tough. If it's like muscular, like if it's like ow, ow, hurt pain, or if it's like a muscular burning, yeah, you deal with it and keep going. But if you're in actual pain, if your joints are hurting, you need to address that ASAP. Or it's not going to improve. Yeah, and here's here's something I think about kind of often, and that is I had a good friend of mine who had to get his ACL done in, like, his junior year of high school, and that's still happening. There's still, like, high school athletes having these really, like, rough injuries and stuff. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, it's people that haven't been moving, people who have, like, bad muscular imbalances. So take the ACL injury, for example. Um, it's, it's typically quad dominance. The quads are really tight. The hamstrings are weak. The glutes are weak. So, like, to kind of protect the knee is when you can create torque at the hip using the glute, so, like, the butt, the, the glute. So if you can, like, kind of externally rotate, like, you almost, like, imagine, like, screwing your foot into the ground, you can create a lot of torque at the hip, and this can, like, protect your knee, and you're not going to have any ACL injuries. But as soon as you lose that glute activation – that knee gets wobbly, you lose stability, and you put, try to put a lot of force through it, and the ACL just goes like that. So it's a combination of, it's mostly people just not moving anymore. People sit around playing video games um, or like one, playing one sport. Like they only play football or they only play basketball or they have this single sport so they don't get this like mix of activities, which is so important to get a variety of things and having a training program that trains for a variety of things as well, I guess. Yeah, that's that was my kind of feeling on it. It was one of those things where he was huge into soccer, right? So all through the summer and then into the fall, right, until winter came around, then maybe indoor soccer, just a ton of it. And I think that's, you know, what what led to it is that just training for that one specific thing and not mixing it up and having any variety in the training. Yeah, because when you get, a, you get a weak point in your, ch in your chain, your movement chain, and you, ch and you train around it, and you can, you're fine training around it once you kind of – have to perform it's not always going to last like if you have a if you have one week chain in your chain it's where it's going to break out you think of like a chain that you kind of pull pull a truck with a chain and there's one week link that only can hold 500 pounds and the rest can hold 20,000 <coughs> the 500 pound chain is going to break at 500 pounds so i mean go ahead will i don't know if you want to yeah i feel like they don't that. they're just not addressing it in high schools like all these high school, yeah, athletes even younger too. Yeah, they're just like yeah. In school, they're not addressing these things. It's like things you know. I know all three of us kind of realize and pick up on, but I feel like all these high school athletes are still getting this disservice done to them. Yeah, I mean, I had a, I had a group of ten year old kids. I had a they have a program called the Road to Strength, and I like I had a group of ten year old kids, and I would and not even lift. I would just teach them how to jump, how to land, how to run, how to like do a proper squat, how to how to push something, how to pull something. And it was 
it was phenomenal, man. The results you see from these kids that were just like kids that didn't move very well. They're like 10 years old, and within six, nine months, they're hitting heat, like big box jumps. They're sprinting fast. They're just like athletes. They can crush a movement screen. And it's like at that age, they're so pliable, too. So it's like they go from like being so used to video games and sitting, and like they're just tight in all the wrong places. And it, it's crazy to see the performance when you kind of fix the quality point of view. People think like the quantity is going to go up. If you fix the quality of movement, your quantity will go up along with it every time. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it, it's something that, unfortunately, you know, the, the school systems with not having enough money and, and whatever, it, it it sucks because that's one of the first things to go, it seems like, is not that the P, PE system, the, the whatever, the gym classes are great because most of those people aren't qualified to do that kind of coaching like what you're talking about, but it it's it's, it's too bad that, it all comes back to money, and, and this country is, you know, in my opinion, and if we hacked half of, we fired half of the politicians and took their salary and put it back in the schools, man, maybe we'd be we'd be a lot better off, you know. But yeah. the, the government, and I, I don't want to get into that topic today, but uh, it's just too bad. It seems like that's uh, we're we're bass backwards with a lot of things in this country. Yeah, yeah, and it's more of a go ahead, well. Yeah, and I feel like gym class, like if you have it, it's more like games or sports class, right? You're gonna do some sports where I feel like you would be getting a much better benefit from doing this stuff we're talking about, learning actually how to move properly. That will last you with for the rest of your your life. I can't remember any of the rules or anything I learned playing broom ball, right, in seventh period. <laughs> Yeah, man, it's, yeah. it's one of those things where I think you need a combination of both. You need the sports, you need the games, and you also need the movement education. But from, from the movement education point, it's more of a how can we not screw these kids up? This should be the real question. So, like, how can we get them out of chairs for eight hours a day? Um, how can we get them quality food when they go to eat? So, I mean, you're not going to see a toddler that can't do a perfect squat. They can't drop their hamstrings to their calves and just sit there, and that's how they sit. Like, was, I've been watching my niece, Chloe, grow up, and, Every like every time she moves, it's just it's just perfect, and I'm just like, how can we not screw this up? There's nothing that needs to be fixed there. The human body is designed to work in a certain, and it's it's just like the program and what you do to it, it'll adapt to whatever you do. So how can we not give it a stimulus that forces it to adapt in a way that we don't want it to? How can we just keep them moving well? That's a good point, man. I mean, like you said, it's kids are so limber and so flexible, and and they move so purely, you know, and yeah. and once. And you're right, you know, uh, then you start the structure of school or whatever it is. Okay, sit down in a classroom for six out of the eight hours of the day. And then when you get home, you got homework and and you go sit down in, in, in a desk or whatever, a hard seat for another hour, two hours a day. And then, oh, but I want to, you know, then most kids sit down and play video games for the rest of the day. So yeah. it's something that I, I think as Oh, we need to probably the initiative to, to 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 push our kids to to focus on some of these things and uh, and that's that's a great point, man. Like I said, I've got a two year old and a six year old, and my six year old will run me into the ground every day, and and a lot of times I'm like, oh, I've got work to do, or I can't, or I and, and I need to probably be doing a better job of yeah, let's go outside and play basketball, you know. Let's let's go downstairs and and let's go over some some movement stuff because he loves to work out, you know. The kid's six and he's he's asking me when when we're gonna put a pack on and go do go for a hike, you know. It's awesome. So, yeah, I mean, and my two year old man, I tell you what, he's watching his bigger brother want to be like his dad, and he's not far behind. So, I mean, that, that's that's a good point. And it's I mean, if nothing else, you know. I just need to know that I, I know I know I need to do better because you make a great point. Watching kids move is, like I said, it, it, it to me, and I'm not I'm not a, a trained eye, but I can see how how effortless things are and how flexible they are and how pure they are. Oh, so if I brought this this um, Anderson over here right now, you could see him get his knees almost up to like his chest. Right? He's he's so just malleable and flexible and like you say, 
he'll he'll kind of push himself up and then go to a full depth like butt to heels squat just like right on me right and it's about not losing yeah. that flexibility and mobility they're they they're born with it they're born yeah. moving like yeah. you guys are talking about with those really great movements right but yeah. it's that Absolutely. singular sport training and never going back to any of this stuff that kind of ruins them yeah and then like um uh, it brings up two like two points that i want to kind of Sure, I guess. The first is like, I'm sure there's a ton of people listening to this like, yeah, kids move, great. We should we should have more gym classes. We should have more recess. But it's like, what are you actually going to do about it? So the advice I give is like, vote with your vote with your wallet. Um, bring your kids to a school that's going to have more movement, or bring them to a gymnastics class, or bring them to a martial arts class. It's like, spend your money in that place because where the money goes, that's where the economy grows in that area. So if that's if that's what you truly want, then vote with your wallet. And the second thing is, as far as like watching the kids move, it's like it gives the perfect example. Like this is this is great for you, Will. So watch watch how your baby kind of starts to learn movement. Like the first thing it does is it kind of it'll get it'll kind of get control of its neck, and it'll, then it'll start to learn how to control yep. its extremities, and it's learning to control its breathing pattern, and it's going to get on or be on a, a knee, a half one knee down, one knee up, and then it's going to slowly get up, and it's going to start squatting, it's going to get up and stand stand up and fall down. And this is the, like, this is, if you give them the correct picture, this is the exact same progression that we move to. We, we take people back to learning how to breathe on their backs. And we take them back to learning how to get full neck mobility and how to move their extremities with their breath and how to create core stability and then how to create core stability when you're on two knees or when you're on all fours and then on two knees and then on one knee. And it's just like you, have to, you kind of have to, if you've lost that mobility, you can get it back. Just watch a baby. <laughs> But like, you can find somebody who can who can uh, help you with that too, I guess. You know, I never thought about it until you drew that comparison, but it's it's pretty spot on with what you're trying to do when you're starting a new athlete out, right? And exactly, yeah. it's, it's one of those things where it's like it's so easy, even a baby can do it, right? Yeah, biology got it right, man. So just like we don't need anything new, we just need to kind of pay attention and learn. Yeah, and that's the thing. The whole like Arnold Schwarzenegger awesome very inspirational huge success right but that style of training has been huge for so long that it's kind of messed up what people think about when they think about working out yeah it's just getting big muscles and the arnold back something that i can't do i'm sure one of you guys can but that's, yeah that's what people think of man the five-day split the back buys chest tries shoulders legs and whatever core however you want to do it and that's it's so much more than that. It's like that's such a specified like small niche. It's like maybe how like one or one or two people should one or two percent of people should train. But that's like what you see ninety percent of people doing. Exactly. Not just hopping on a treadmill and just running. Oh, I see that a lot. I see that a lot. And it's like the disappearing ass syndrome, right? Next time you're out in public, yeah, start, right. <laughs> start looking at people, right? Start looking at them and see who no longer has a butt. Right, because they're not squatting, they're not working it out. It's just disappeared from them. Yep, exactly. And those are the people that are at risk for the ACL injuries too. Yeah, the glutes, man. The two things, like the two biggest things, like if you can teach somebody to use their diaphragm and their breathing and to activate their glutes, you'd be shocked at what people can start doing and like how their physique will come around, how much better they're going to look, how much better they'll perform. The knee or the back pain, low back pain, those always goes away. Knee pain will go away. Like those two things, get the glutes working, get the diaphragm working. Yeah, you want that squat booty. Hell yeah. <laughs> you can get up on Instagram with those, with those tight, tight pants on. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's why I wear those <laughs> tights. <laughs> Show it off. Maybe I'll start doing that. Like, that'll be my Instagram. I haven't been, I haven't been posting on Instagram. You so should. I'm trying to get some you're, followers. You're, maybe. maybe let's have yoga pants on. You need. Go get yourself some nice, nice virus tights. Use the coupon code SKELETON. <laughs> you'll get 10% off. That's the uh, Attitude Nation Perfect. code. Yeah, you get yourself some nice 10% off. They just came out with a green series. It's pretty cool looking. Yeah, people people love the tights. Nice squat booty and some tights. You'll be huge. <laughs> Learn to twerk a little bit. Yeah, that's what I oh, use Instagram Phil for. famous in no time. Yeah, that's what I'm using Phil for. Is that <laughs> they call him Big Sexy for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> I'm prostituting him out on our social media as much as possible. <laughs> Whatever no, you follow, not, man. <laughs> let's not go there. And so I've got, I've, I've only got one more question here, Rajesh, that that I wanted to ask you your opinion on, and 
you know, for a hunter, let's say that, you know, more specifically somebody who's going to be spending some time in the backcountry and nutrition on a five-day or a seven-day hunt is always critical. But, you know, it seems like the popularity in, in the, the high-fat, no-carb type diet that, you know, whether it's the ketosis diet or, or, or whatever you call it, right? What's your thoughts on that for backcountry style hunting and nutrition? Yeah, it's a good question, man. Um, I think there's a, there's a lot of things to consider there. It's like how long is your trip? How much weight can you take? The big thing about fat, too, is you can, you can get a lot of energy. Like there's, for each gram of fat, there's nine calories. There's for a gram of carbs, you get four. For a gram of protein, you get four. So for each gram and a gram of fat, you're getting twice the energy. So if, if weight's a big thing, like fat is, fat is great to bring. Like have stuff that you can, that you can stack on that's fat. Um, remind me of the question one more time. I just kind of lost it for yeah. a second. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just that the, you know, the, the, the seems like the, the rise in popularity and awareness of, of that high fat diet, you know, and, and like you said, exactly yeah. where you started with there with, you know, you, you can carry a lot more calories and less weight with that type of a diet. But if you're not, I guess, um, you can't just all of a sudden say, okay, I've been eating normal grains and, and, and breads and, you know, whatever vegetables and meats. And then all of a sudden for hunting, I'm just going to go over to this type of diet because you're probably going to be a hurting unit if you don't take any, yeah, absolutely. Anything. but if you've prepped your body and you've tr- transitioned your lifestyle into that type of high fat diet, it, it, there's, there's a lot of benefits, but I mean, tell me more from, from a physical standpoint, from your opinion on that, that type of high fat diet is, is it really, is it, do you feel it's beneficial or is it, is it just a fad? Is there not enough, you know, studies out there yet? What's your thoughts? Um, I think the biggest thing with the high fat diet is like people are losing a lot of weight. Um, people think like, oh, fat, it's, like, it's been flip flop, you know, and, like in the eighties it was eat high, it used to be eat high fat and it was like, oh no, fat's terrible. Eat high carb. And now carbs are terrible. So eat high fat again. So it's, it's, it's just this like kind of, uh, I guess a little bit of hype and it's kind of a trend, but I don't think, I think that's obviously good for you. Carbs are good for you. Um, the thing about the high fat diet is the brain primarily works on glucose, which is what carbs are broken down into in the bloodstream. So the brain wants to work on glucose and for you to get to, that's why the ketosis works is, is ketones. The brain can also work on ketones, which can be made from fat. Uh, it takes a few days. So like if you were eating a bunch of carbs and you decided to run the backward and you're going to have fat, like you said, you're going to be a hurting unit. You're going to have absolutely no energy. You're, you're probably going to feel pretty sick. It's not a good idea. Don't go from like n- no, or from eating a bunch of carbs to no carbs. But I mean, it definitely has some, some merit too. Like there's a lot of stuff on a, I don't know if you've ever heard of metabolic typing. Um, it's a, it came from a, it's a this really old diet, basically. This guy, Weston Price, I think his name was, he's a doctor back in like the 1900s. But basically, he traveled the world and like found that people who were, who had been eating the same type of foods for a long time were generally way healthier than people that are like taking on the Western civilization where they're kind of introducing a bunch of new foods. And the idea behind it is people who like lived in more so northern climates, colder climates, did better on a high fat, high protein diet. And people who closer to the equator where there's a lots of fruits and vegetables, do better on a high carb diet. And I mean, everybody needs protein. I think the one thing we can kind of say is like everybody needs a good amount of protein for optimal performance. But I think for the most part, yeah, if your ancestry comes from Northern climates, I would a high fat diet's a good idea, but not like you have to go, you don't have to go into ketosis and only eat fats unless that's something you want to do. But I think the big thing with only eating fats or only eating carbs is that it, it cuts out so many foods that makes so you can't eat them. So like if you can't eat if you can't eat fat or if you can't eat carbs, you just cut out all kinds of grains. So you're gonna naturally eat way less total amount of food, and that's where that weight loss comes from. So it, it's a, it's kind of a balance between the calories you take into the body and the calories you burn up. So it all comes down to energy balance. So you could say, and you either got to increase your metabolism or decrease the amount of energy you take in. Yeah, I'm I'm I don't know, man. I've been seeing a lot of people. Like you said, do that, and and they are a lot of people do shed weight, and it makes sense now. You know, like you said, it's 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 a different it's a different uh, approach all around to to your nutrition, and and will you you uh you go about uh, diet with uh, um counting your macros and stuff, right? Is that how you kind of yeah? Is that what you try that, to follow? Yeah, that's one of my favorite ways because I find it easier, and that's the thing. 
people might like paleo, they might like the ketogenic diets, they might like just kind of, you know, macros. It's sometimes what I think best fits your lifestyle, right? Or what you're naturally good at is usually the best diet to follow. Uh, but I yeah. did do the whole ketogenic thing and Ben kind of walked me through it last almost about like 10 months ago, 12, 11 months ago or so when I did that strongman competition, I had to cut from like in the two, I don't know, like 21 or something to like 207. Right. And so yeah. leading out to that, uh, like six weeks or so, it was like a crash course in ketogenic dieting and man, it worked great. I felt like, well, I had to dehydrate a bunch like the last day too. But other than that, man, I was feeling really good. And after like I got rehydrated, I was feeling strong. So there's definitely something to it. And it, it makes me think like, man, that means because of our ancestry, we'd be on like two different styles of diets, right? Which is kind of cool to think about. Yeah, every, everybody's metabolism is different. Like what macros are going to work best for you aren't necessarily going to work best for someone else. Um, as far as like keep things, if we're going to work with macros, what I would kind of suggest is if, if you're naturally a bigger guy, if you, if you, if you tend to pack on a lot of fat, like you're, it's called an endomorph, um, you're going to be better off cutting the carbs a little bit lower and going up a little bit more with the fat. And if you're kind of in the middle, what they call a mesomorph, where you're naturally a little bit more muscular, you might put on a few pounds of fat, but once you hit the gym, you, you pack on a lot of muscle easy, you're going to probably do pretty good in kind of what they call like the zone diet, where you're getting like one third of your calories from carbs, one third from protein, one third from fat. And if you're naturally like a skinny guy, like where you excel in running, and you're just naturally skinny, and you're always just you're always kind of thumping, you're always like heart beating fast. Those guys do really well on like lots of carbs. Yeah. The way I typically do it when I'm coach. Go ahead. No, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just agreeing with you there. Okay, cool. So the way I do it when I'm coaching is I use what's called a habit-based um, coaching, and this is really bad. It's like change psychology. So this would be obvious if I was training one of you guys, where you guys are like serious, like get after. I'm gonna crush, train a hunt. I'm gonna win the competition. I wouldn't be using habit-based coaching, but like for the most part, for the guy I was about earlier, who's like, I just want to get in shape so I can feel better, so I can enjoy hunting. I can just do what I love, and I can continue to do it to an old age. Um, we just kind of start. I have them track their diet for three days, and then I'll just, you know, pick one thing at a time, and we'll work on it for two weeks, and we'll add another thing. So, for example, we might, my, one of my clients right now is like he had a he's a bunch of problems when he's trying to cut weight, so we, all we did was up his, he wasn't drinking very much water, he's drinking a bunch of soda, he's drinking a bunch of energy drinks, so we just cut those out and we added water. And that's all we're going to work on for the next two weeks. And then almost without a doubt, he'll lose a few pounds in those two weeks and then we'll work on the next thing. So it's always one thing at a time. That's, that, that's the way I kind of like to do it. And I have a, uh, I'm partnering with a company called Precision Nutrition, who's like the biggest oh, yeah, online nutrition yeah, company. Oh, yeah, I know about Precision Nutrition, yeah. Yeah, so I'm kind of partnering partnering with them, and I'm like their whole like lean eating po coaching program. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be using that as like the nutrition aspect for some of my clients. So I have the whole like year long curriculum, all the habits, everything like that, and like how to how to personalize it for each individual person. And I mean their results are out of this world, like just over a year. And like and the, the big thing is like different between them and other people. It's not that they get to get the results quickest; it's that they maintain them. Like if you if you go through it this way, because you're learning new habits that you can maintain for your entire life. You're learning why nutrition, like why protein is good for you, how much you should eat. You're learning why you need to eat vegetables, uh, what happens when you're deficient in vegetables, how much you should eat, how to measure them, how to use your palms to measure a serving of protein, how to use your palms to measure a serving of vegetables. What is Like it? one it's serving a, of protein is about the size of your... Yeah, it's like the, your palm is the protein, your hand is the carbs, and your thumb is the fat. Is that what it is? Yeah, pretty close. Um, the palm is typically one serving of protein. Um, for guys, you kind of start with like two servings and girls will start with one typically. Um, your fist is normally vegetables. Same thing, two for guys, um, one for girls. A cupped handful is normally carbs, so it's either some kind of like a grain or a, a fruit a lot of the time. Or, like, I don't know. I could fill a like lot that. in that hand, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> Have that thing overflow. Yeah, yeah. It's, just, it's, just a, it's a good idea, a good reference point for people to kind of start with, and they can make the adjustments on what works for them there. I, yeah, that's, so it's, it's, super, it's been you. super. I've actually used that a few times, and it's super helpful. Yeah, and you just you start to just know it. Like, like you, you use it for a few weeks, maybe a month, and you're like, oh, I know it. I know what that looks like now. So it's, it's not like you look at this plate and because it's healthy. You know, you're like, okay, I need more protein. So when you go to the restaurant, you're like, well, can I get double protein and double vegetables and half the carbs? And all of a sudden, you took this meal that wasn't that healthy, and now it's a pretty healthy meal. 
right? And it's it's a lot like judging yardage, right? You can walk up, look at it, and know. Like the numbers start coming to you. Yeah, exactly. This is this is actually my first year archery hunt. So like that's like me. I'm like a beginner. I I would look. I'd be. I'm a little bit because I've been. I played a lot of football, so I kind of know it a little bit. But like you guys would be like, way better at that than me. But like as I do it more and more, I'm gonna start to kind of get it. And I'm not gonna really need to use a rangefinder in close distances or anything like that. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Well, it's about that time where I have to get home to that baby. So, <laughs> that being said, if you want to check out Josh, head on over to joshnordwick.com or you can find his Mountain Fit the Hunter's Solution. Is it the Hunter's Solution to training or is it just the Hunter's Solution? It's the Hunter's Fitness Solution. The Hunter's Fitness Solution. So, Mountain Fit. Yeah, Mountain Fit, the Hunter's Fitness Solution. It's a group on Facebook. And there's usually a tip on there at least every day or so. Yeah, I try to do like, like a tip a day, a couple motivational posts a week, a couple articles a week. Just kind of keep everything you'll need for fitness in there. And if you're like Phil and I and unlike Josh and, and you're a fan of the pre-workouts, where can you go, Phil? You can go to Mountain Ops at getmountainops.com. That's right. That's exactly where you can go. So if you want to try some out, Josh, you know, feel free to go get yourself 20% off by using the coupon code MBH20 at checkout, and that will get you 20% off your Mountain Ops purchase. Also, if you Perfect. want. Perfect. Yeah, and if you like great optics, great binoculars, Josh, which you may, you can get yourself a free gift if you want a pair of Mavens, you know, what we love about Mavens is not only are they great glass but at a great price, but also the all the customizable options you can do with them. And you can get a free gift, some free Maven swag when you order. If you use the coupon code NBHGIFT at checkout at mavenbuilt.com, and you'll get yourself some nice Maven optics. And if you want to get your hands on some live in person, if you're in my area of upstate New York, you can contact me. I'll let you look through them as long as you don't have greasy peanut butter and jelly hands, you know, nice clean hands on those. Or you can go to No Limits Archery in the Denver metro area, and Phil has them in stock. Do you have the uh, – the, um... I've got the B1s and the B2s. I've got, I've got a set of uh, B1 8x42s, and I've got a set of B2s that are the 11x45s. And are you getting a scope? I'll be getting, uh, I should be, I'm going to be ordering my spot. Did you lose him, Josh? Yeah, I think, I think he just got cut off there, yeah. Yeah. Phil, can you hear us? We lost you. It's all on you, Will. You got to finish it on your own. <laughs> See, I, 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 I wanted to know what he was going to say about the spotting scope, though. It's how, I'm interested in it. <laughs> Phil, like that cut off the worst point. I know. Phil's leaving us hanging. This will be a cliff cliffhanger ending. If you want to know about this spotting scope, you're either going to have to A, call Phil, B, hit him up on Facebook, or C, get your ass down to No Limits Archery in the Denver metro area. Oh, hold on. I've got a text here from Phil. Don't worry. You don't have to do any of that. End of July, <laughs> Phil's going to have that spotting scope in possession at No Limits Archery, so you can head on over and check that out. I hope he pimped it out on colors. I hope it's not some lame, lame, just generic thing. Uh, probably will be. Damn, Phil. Oh, it is. He's shaking his head yes. Oh, well. If you want something, I expected something sexy out of Big Sexy. But if you want to get yourself something sexy or maybe something, you know, for your wife or domestic partner, whatever you got going on, you can head on over there. <laughs> Phil's laughing at that when he like that. You can go head on over to mavenbuilt.com and, you know, go through all the camo and color options and do it up right. Like I would do it and uh, order it up and use that coupon code NBHGIFT at checkout. Also, don't forget, subscribe to our iTunes, like us, give us a review. It helps us a bunch and we really appreciate it. Or uh, subscribe on YouTube. And I love seeing your comments when you write on to YouTube. It's a lot of fun. Um, head to naturalbornhunter.com. Check us out on Facebook and Instagram. 
Uh, also, you can look for Josh Nordwick's Instagram to soon be featuring him in some very tight tights. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right, twerking ladies. All day. What's that? That's what I'll be twerking the whole time. There we go. All that's, twerk videos. That's, that's how you get big, baby. All right. <laughs> <laughs> this has been the Natural Born Hunter podcast. Wake up, chase your dreams, repeat.